All right. Um, we're going to have a change in the uh, order agenda order here. The last two presentations are from working groups of council. And one of the requirements of working groups is that they give an annual, at least one annual report to the full council. And so today, uh, Terry Manolio is going to give the report for the Genomic Medicine Working Group. All right, good afternoon. Um, this is our annual report from our uh, uh, very active genomic medicine working group of the council. Uh, this is a list of the group's members. Um, you'll see uh, one of our, our current council members on this list uh, as well, uh, yeah, you are, um, and uh, several who had previously been on council, and then uh, several of us join uh, ex officio. Uh, just to remind you of the charge to this group, it's to assist in advising us on research needed to evaluate and move genomics into routine medical practice, including re uh, reviewing current progress and identifying gaps, identifying and publicizing key advances, planning genomic medicine meetings on timely themes, and facilitating collaborations. Um, to look at this second bullet a little in a little bit more detail, uh, the group actually reviews um, a, a number, usually about eight or ten um, uh, publications that are are identified by John Avina Rula, our, our program analyst, um, that are sort of candidates for being identified as accomplishments in genomic medicine. Uh, we do that every month, um, and and they do a fantastic job of that. Uh, when we select a paper, and I'll show you the criteria in a, in a a moment, um, they then go on to this uh, uh, website, Accomplishments in Genomic Medicine, that is very ably put together by John Avi and, and Makul Narakar of our Office of Communications. Um, this is a searchable uh, database. You can see here there are a variety of ways to search it. Here's a, a paper um, uh, just recently um, from December or so. And the criteria we use uh, are listed on the website. They involve using the patient's genomic variant information, demonstrating the impact of clinical implementation likely to be generalizable beyond the original setting, uh, have imp uh, implications for practice guidelines or, or healthcare systems, uh, are important considerations for for diversity and health equity, sufficiently large and rigorous, and broadly representative of the field. And then we do try to categorize them. Um, and they don't have to meet all of these criteria, but it's, you know, the more they meet, the more likely they are to be included. And then we categorize them in, in sort of different groups. Um, about five years ago, one of our members, Pat Deverka, who also was on this council, um, said, wouldn't it be cool if we put together sort of a year in review where we identify, say, the top 10 advances from the previous year? Uh, easier said than done, but the uh, American Journal of Human Genetics has been very generous in, in accepting uh, these commentaries. We've done one each year, actually, um, and we're up to five of them, which is, which is terrific. Uh, one of the things we do is to sort of look at among the various categories of papers, uh, paper topics, you know, are there shifts or changes in the field? You can see, for instance, sequencing was really big in 2019 to 2022, particularly in the earlier years. It's much less so in blue here um, as, as shown there. And so there have been a little bit of shifts over time, not, not a tremendous amount. Um, if you have a paper that you think we should include, please send us a nomination, gmwg at nih.gov. Uh, another very important uh, function of the Genomic Medicine Working Group is to plan roughly annual genomic medicine meetings. Uh, the topics of the first 12 of them are shown here. Uh, it's, it's become more than can fit on a single slide, so the, the last three, including one that was held in November on population screening, um, are shown here. Um, and these have been extremely productive, and so uh, looking at just at the first one uh, actually gave birth to the uh, what became the Clinical Genomics Resource, or ClinGen, uh, that now is a, uh, uh, shares a global uh, genomics, um, genomic gene curation, sorry, gene curation coalition, the GenCC. Um, the second meeting uh, led to our adding pharmacogenetics into uh, early phases of eMERGE and the initial phase of the Implementing Genomics in Clinical Practice, or IGNITE, consortium. Uh, I can't actually show you them from all of the, of the meetings because they won't fit on one slide, so I'll skip over three. The fourth one was on physician education. It led to the uh, ISCC-PEG, the Intersociety Coordinating Committee for Practitioner Education in Genomics, 
uh, Eric um, uh, showed you uh, um, some of the advances of that group, including their ISCC PEG uh, scholars program, very active in uh, early uh, training, early career investigators. Uh, the sixth meeting on international collaborations led to the Global Genomic Medicine uh, Consortium and or collaborative, uh, and the International Hundred Thousand Cohorts Consortium. Um, the eighth meeting um, led to, uh, was a, sort of an overview of all of our, our programs. It led to the recognition we needed to have modules that would sort of fit in and out uh, for educating um, uh, various kinds of practitioners. So that was a notice that we produced. Um, the, the ninth meeting on sort of bedside, back, bedside to bench and back again um, uh, led to the variant function and disease um, uh, program announcement, which is actually still active. I should update the, the PA number there. Um, the 10th meeting on pharmacogenetics uh, led to one of the IGNITE trials. Actually, the, it's a three-armed trial that you heard about uh, in Eric's director's report, Adopt PGX, uh, which is looking at the impact of uh, pharmacogenetics on clinical care in depression and acute and chronic pain. Uh, the 11th meeting on implementation actually led to a subsequent meeting uh, with a group of employers interested in using genomics uh, in their health and wellness this programs. Uh, that's something that we're still um, hoping will come to fruition uh, further on. The 12th meeting on polygenic risk led both to the eMERGE uh, genomic risk assessment uh, phase that uh, Emer has just told you about, as well as the primed or uh, polygenic risk methods development or polygenic risk methods um, in uh, diverse populations uh, that's, that's developing methods for um, uh, assessing polygenic risk in diverse populations. Uh, the 13th meeting on inf informatics uh, led to a notice on patient-centered informatics and actually is leading to what will, will soon be another um, workshop uh, focusing on uh, building a data ecosystem for uh, genomic medicine. The 14th meeting, this is the 14th meeting. Um, oh, on genomic learning health systems um, was uh, uh, the um, genesis for both the genomic LHS RFA that you um, uh, heard about back in September, I believe. September, yeah, um, and uh, we'll be seeing again in May when the applications uh, come to you. Um, and then the, that also led to the regional uh, genomic medicine uh, con uh, consultation service that um, you heard about in, uh, uh, earlier. Uh, and then the uh, 15th meeting that we just held um, led to the population screening concept that you just approved. So uh, the group has been busy. Um, all of the meetings that we held that we hold actually are live streamed. Um, many thanks to Gerald Samani and his group for, for doing that for us. Uh, and they are also archived. Uh, you can go onto our website and see the archive that includes both the videos, the um, uh, actual presentations, and then uh, very nice uh, executive and meeting summaries prepared by our, our very capable program analysts. Uh, as we heard uh, earlier, I think Iftikhar, um, an avid reader of our strategic vision, noted um, that one of the strategic vision goals was to test public health approaches for implementing population-wide genomic screening, and we're proud that, um, that the 15th uh, meeting led to that. Uh, just to tell you a little bit more about that, the, the goals of that meeting were to review the current state of population genomic screening in the U.S., of which there is not much um, other than newborn screening, uh, examine obstacles and opportunities opportunities for expanded screening um, and the evidence of its impact, and then I'd identify research directions. And keep in mind, the research directions that are identified by these meetings are for the entire field, not just for NHGRI. Um, we're much too small to be able to address them all. Uh, among their recommendations included included really focusing on uh, engagement and, and equity. The pilot studies for near tier one conditions, it wasn't just near tier one, it, you know, so tier one conditions, the three that uh, the CDC currently lists, plus others that are likely to be added soon. Uh, Gail mentioned hereditary hemochromatosis. Um, there are others that are sort of on the starting blocks as well. Um, and uh, uh, including engagement of the prevention research community because the prevention community is going to have to, um, you know, help us to, to to uh, uh, implement this as well as to, to uh, encourage uptake uh, in the provider community. Um, and then, you know, very important to, 
have approaches to ensure equitable, equitable implementation of uh, population screening and follow-up, uh, which often leave, um, uh, unfortunately, health disparities sometimes worse off um, once we implement a, a uh, new technology. There are a number of recommendations related to data management and analysis, including improved methods for storage access, access and transportability of screening data uh, by the patient or by um, health systems or researchers, uh, developing or improving evidence-based models for evaluating genomic screening tests. Uh, it was interesting that some of the people that were involved in the original tier one uh, tests said, you know, in 12 years, these models for assessing these things have not changed, and, and maybe that needs to be addressed. Um, uh, developing probabilistic models for adding genes for screening similar to the Richards criteria uh, from 2015, I believe, uh, for um, uh, variant curation. The ACMG is, it has started an effort um, to, to address this, uh, but um, that's ongoing. And then improved estimates of numbers needed to screen the penetrance and natural history of conditions. Uh, that won't be addressed in the uh, screening concept that you saw, but is something that uh, was recognized as being very important to uh, be done in, in existing biobanks and databases. In addition, they encouraged uh, efforts to improve clinical workflow and communication with providers and patients, including uh, methods to reduce the complexity of and standardized, uh, standardized pretest consent and ordering, um, enabling labs to link genetic results reports with physician consultation um, if, when that's needed and with clinical decision support tools, um, the, you know, potentially exploring the roles for art artificial intelligence in reporting and following up of screening results, um, methods to support ongoing contact and communication with patients as genomic knowledge changes and approaches for setting realistic expectations among both providers and patients um, for genomic screening, mitigating risks of false reassurance. So people who get a, a, a negative test on this should still recognize they are still at risk. They're just not at high genomic risk um, and facilitating accurate communication of results within families. Th this issue of false reassurance got a lot of attention, a lot of discussion. Um, this paper was quoted from Gazaskas et al. at the University of Washington to avoid the risks of false reassurance individuals with a negative screening result, which is, you know, nearly 98 percent of all who were tested in that uh, study should receive effective communication that they still need standard uh, screening tests um, as, as recommended. This is the, uh, the total budget of the, the genomic medicine research program um, in fiscal 23. Uh, shown here are our six of our major um, efforts in genomic medicine, plus three that aren't exactly genomic medicine, but they're very foundational to that, um, that effort. And you can see the, the amounts spent on them, um, 26 million in our investigator-initiated portfolio, uh, and varying amounts in, in other contributions and in these other programs. And lots of co-funding from our uh, sister institutes. I have to, to um, shout out to uh, Aaron Ramos and um, uh, Joanella Morales and Iman Martin who, for being very, very effective in uh, bringing funding into the multi-omics uh, program, but also um, in Phoenix and in other programs. Uh, this is the budget that you saw Carolyn showed um, uh, earlier uh, in terms of uh, this is now just the budget for genomic medicine, uh, and you can see that it's grown very nicely um, over the, you know, first eight years or so, um, and this is the growth in the uh, NIH, sorry, the NHGRI uh, extramural budget um, shown along the, the um, Y2 axis uh, there, and you can see we had a, a nice growth uh, at a period, even when the, the NHGRI budget actually dropped down a little bit because this was an area of emphasis. Uh, in the past four years, however, it's been a little bit more um, um, stable, as, as it were, even as the NIH budget has increased. We don't expect those budget increases to continue, um, so we, we do have some concern about uh, potential growth. This is just showing you um, uh, some thoughts about uh, both a timeline of, of our current major programs and some thoughts about the future. Uh, it's very prescient of asking the question about, you know, potential for follow-up of uh, uh, the patients who receive their, their JIRA uh, results in um, uh, the, this current phase of eMERGE. That is uh, certainly a possibility and, and one that we would uh, like to discuss with you uh, in the near future. 
the IGNITE program, the Pragmatic Clinical Trials Network, um, will be ending in fiscal 24. That's this year. Um, so uh, it's, you know, the, the results should be out. We will obviously bring those to you um, and are planning to publish them. Um, the ClinGen program is likely to continue, and you can see, you know, there's sort of question marks for all of these because none have been approved to move forward. Primed also, there's a possibility of continuing uh, the Advancing Genomic Medicine, RFA, which is a, essentially an investigator-initiated program, uh, one that we want to, uh, to see continue and stimulate uh, investigator-initiated applications. The multi-omics uh, in health and disease, who knows, uh, it's just starting, so we're not sure. And I should show you here's, here's where, where we are currently. Um, should we, uh, with the, uh, the concept that you approved earlier today, population screening uh, may be something that we will start in fiscal 25. Uh, should we consider a, a PRS trial after the follow-up of the, uh, the current eMERGE um, and work uh, by PRIMED? Um, should we consider something in the EHR integration of genomics or a genomic data ecosystem following the workshop that we're planning? So there are a number of things, sort of irons in the fire that we're considering. And I would just like to show you that following the, um, the encouragement from council and also a, a lot of really um, dedicated efforts to increase the investigator-initiated applications that we're receiving and to be sure that they uh, received a, a review that had at, you know, appropriate expertise in genomic medicine, um, that proportion has grown and it will probably level off right around the, the mid to high 30s. Um, and this is just a, a reminder of those RFAs, which have a, a continuing sort of a rolling uh, receipt. Um, I believe now it's, we're back to, to once a year. But uh, you saw that uh, that renewal uh, a council or two ago. Um, the, there was slight revisions to it that are shown here in blue to improve sharing, to improve the diversity. Uh, NCI has signed on, which is wonderful, um, and um, uh, addressing health disparities. So. All of those things are improvements that we thank you for encouraging us to do. So just uh, as looking back then at uh, the, our 2020 strategic vision here, there were a number of things that were cited as, as potentials for genomic medicine. Um, you heard the, today about the uh, population-wide genomic screening, so we can check that off. The multiple omics approaches um, is, in, is underway. The design and use of genomic learning healthcare systems, you'll be seeing in May the, the applications for that. Uh, developing a genomic medicine e-consult service, the RFAs for that are, are out now. and, uh, and will be due shortly. And then a clinical informatics research strategy has been developed, and we are, are hoping to pursue it even further um, in the coming months. So with that, I will stop and thank my many colleagues who have contributed to this, as well as the um, uh, Genomic Medicine Working Group members and the investigators and participants of our genomic medicine uh, programs. So I will stop there. Thank you, Terry. Questions for Terry? Iftikhar, go ahead, please. I really don't have a question, but I want to congratulate Terry and Eric and everybody uh, in the leadership for this um, amazing kind of portfolio, uh, which I think will have tremendous impact on, on genomics, particularly the translational aspect. But I, I particularly admire how this has kind of gone through as um, there was an enormous effort invested in the <clears throat> strategic vision, and then it has been very nicely coupled to these working group meetings, and, and then those then lead to these uh, concepts. So when a concept is presented, it has really gone through a very careful uh, and a lot of deliberation, and uh, the, the, the programs that have resulted have had a huge influence on the field. So I just want to express my uh, admiration and congratulations for the way this has come out uh, in, in these programs have been uh, proposed. Thank you. Thank you, Iftikhar. That's very kind. Okay. Thank you, Terry. <clears throat>